Hello and welcome. My name is Lisa Hatfield, your host for this Patient Empowerment Network Start Here program, where we bridge the expert and patient voice to enable you and me to feel comfortable asking questions of our healthcare teams. The world is complicated, but understanding your multiple myeloma doesn't have to be. The goal is to create actionable pathways for getting the most out of myeloma treatment and survivorship. Joining me today is Dr. Alawadi, backed by popular demand. Dr. Alawadi is a respected multiple myeloma expert from Mayo Clinic. Dr. Alawadi's career focus includes the treatment of plasma cell disorders like myeloma and understanding the epidemiology and pathophysiology of this disorder. It's always such a pleasure having you, Dr. Alawadi. I'm really excited you're joining us again. So thank you for joining us. Thanks a lot for having me, Lisa. This is excellent. I look forward to this uh, next iteration of the Patient Department Network Start Here program. Thank you. So before we dive into today's discussion, please take a moment to download the program resource guide using the QR code. This guide contains pertinent information to guide you both before and after the program. <clears throat> and this program will provide you with a comprehensive update on the latest myeloma news and its implications for you and your family. Following that, we'll launch into some questions that we have received from you. So let's start here. Dr. Alawadi, at this juncture in myeloma history, we are witnessing unprecedented activity, a surge in new treatment options, and a wealth of insights. Today, we are privileged to have your expertise to help us decipher these developments and shed light on the adv advancements shaping the landscape of myeloma care. First, we're going to get a high-level update from Dr. Alawadi on what the latest myeloma news means for you and your family, and then we're going to talk about some questions that you've sent in. So let's get started with the high level update, Dr. Alawadi. Can you speak to the latest news and priorities in the rapidly expanding myeloma treatment landscape? Excellent. I think, uh, Lisa, that's an excellent, important question because, as you rightly mentioned, there is such a large amount of data that is coming through for myeloma all the time. I mean, it's almost we we kind of talk about the fact that every time you turn the uh, turn your uh, shoulder or look over your shoulder there is a new drug approved. So I can imagine this can be very overwhelming. So what I'll say is that in my opinion, there are some categories of new data that are pertinent and important for our patients. Uh, the two, two or three out of them that come to my mind, one is what's called cell mods, or uh, there are a couple of agents there called iberdamide, mesigdamide. These are showing some interesting data Important to keep in mind that they are somewhat related to the immunomodulatory drugs, lenalidomide, pomalidomide, but they're showing benefit in patients who have had len and POM before and have progressed. So exciting stuff there. We're also seeing some interesting data about newer CAR Ts and bispecific antibodies. Uh, they are all coming up with some um, uh, benefits in some cases. I think important to keep in mind that the bispecifics are landing at the 60 to 70% response rate, and CAR Ts are typically landing at the 80 to 90% response rate. But there are more agents expected. There are also some newer bispecifics in different classes, like one of them is called Sevastamab, which is an FCRH5D inhibitor or targeting bispecific. So newer bispecific, not just more of the same category. And um, there has also been recent data about BCL2 inhibitors, which have been traditionally used for patients with translocation 1114. There have been some negative data, negative as in trials which did not pan out with a drug called venetoclax. But there are two other drugs that had some recent data shown uh, from different companies, which were exciting information. So in my mind, those are kind of the broad new drug categories. There is another, a couple of other quick things that I'll mention. One is uh, we're getting more and more information about real world experience with these new drugs. It's good to see that CAR Ts are panning out very similar in the real world as they are in clinical trials. Um, we're also seeing that the side effect profile of a lot of these newer novel immunotherapy drugs is similar as seen in the clinical trials. Uh, racial ethnic uh, disparities are something which are very close to my heart, and there is more and more information coming out in that. Unfortunately, highlighting the disparities more still, rather than yet coming up with solutions. And um, I think the last thing that I feel which has been recent has been uh, at, at the American Society of Hematology meeting in 2023, which was in December in San Diego, 
one of the myeloma studies actually became a plenary session uh, presentation, which is a pretty big deal for uh, any disease area. So once one thing is that it gets highlighted. Secondly, it was um, a combination of a regimen called isatuximab with carfilzomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone in newly diagnosed patients. And it's a randomized trial, phase three, which uh, was presented. I think the important part is we saw unprecedented deep responses and patients in much, much higher numbers than before becoming MRD negative. So very deep responses. So these are kind of some very broad, but lots of highlights that I talked about. All right, thank you. So can you also talk about some of the newer tools for myeloma progression and relapse and what patients might wanna know about that? And in particular, maybe talk a bit about um, MRD testing and the role of MRD testing for patients who relapse. Excellent question. Um, Lisa, I think the first and foremost thing, the important part for our patients to learn is uh, what are their tumor markers, quote unquote, for the, or disease markers for myeloma? Um, we can follow myeloma by either the M spike or monoclonal protein, by light chains, by monoclonal protein in the urine or blood. Um, and it's important to keep that in mind because every now and then we'll see patients who say, hey, my ratio changed, so I'm progressing. Well, that comes after the light chains change. So it's important to understand the role of these things. Uh, so M spike in the urine, M spike in the serum and light chains. One of them is typically the marker for a patient. Now the MRD status or minimal residual disease, that is looking for one cell, one uh, myeloma cell from amongst 100,000 cells in the bone marrow. So it is looking at a very deep level. The most important benefit of MRD testing right now is to understand that if a patient turns MRD negative, then they have a superior outcome, their prognosis is better. Their progression-free survival or the time before their disease comes back is longer. And when a patient is MRD negative and is being followed or maintenance or whatever, if the bone marrow turns MRD positive, then that might be the sign that the disease might be coming back. Right now, we do not keep switching drugs to get to MRD negative. That is not the goal of treatment. The way to think about it is we want to get to MRD negative, but that means it's incumbent upon us to try and pick a regimen that is more likely to get to MRD negative. That's the way to think about it. Let's pick a regimen more likely to get us into MRD negative and hope that we get to MRD negative. We see every now and then that the patients keep switching regimens just to get to MRD negative. That's not the way to go because you're just using up options too quickly, too fast. And when uh, a common question that patients ask is, well, does that mean I need to get annual bone marrow biopsies and MRD testing? Mm, probably not, that's too much testing. So what I suggest is that once somebody has turned MRD negative, it's important to keep an eye on every single thing, not change in any of the routine labs, imaging, new symptoms, et cetera. That's when we switch to the bone marrow again and see if the patient had turned MRD positive. There are clinical trials going on right now which are stopping drug based on repeat MRD negativity or starting drug on MRD positivity. But those are clinical trial questions. Okay, thank you for that. So along those same lines, um, since you're a Mayo physician, I'm curious about the mass spec testing. So if a patient, say, has been MRD negative for some time, still wants to monitor at a deeper level, even though it's not commercialized yet, do you see a role for mass spec testing um, on a regular basis in the future and, and being rolled out to community facilities also? Absolutely, Lisa. I did not specifically bring it up because mass spec is not, like you rightly said, is not yet commercially available. Now we're doing mass spec quite frequently at Mayo Clinic. Basically mass spec is taking up a blood sample. Important to keep in mind, it's not a bone marrow test, it's a blood test, but it looks for those abnormal proteins based on the protein weight at a much, much lower level. Our SPEP or serum protein electrophoresis does not pick up very small quantities of the protein mass spec does. So in an essence, the mass spec, if somebody is negative on that, 
turning mass spec negative to mass spec positive may be an earlier sign of the disease coming back rather than the SPEP yet turning positive. But as you rightly said, it is not yet commercially available. Um, I do see the benefit of it. There is more and more data coming in favor of it. And there was data that was also at ASH. So um, I do see that in the future, we'll be able to most likely have it available more widely. At this point, it is just a blood test to um, attempt to uh, check the disease level at a much deeper level and be able to notice if the disease is progressing sooner than our currently available tools. Great, thank you. And as a patient, I like to have one more data point that they can get from my blood, not from my bone marrow, yes. to assess the disease. So thank you for explaining that. Regarding survivorship, um, patients are living longer with myeloma in general because of the novel therapies that have come out in the past few years. So how, how is myeloma survivorship evolving and what's different now than it was in five or 10 years ago in terms of treatment planning? Yeah, I think it's very important to keep that in mind. When I see a newly diagnosed patient, I'm not just telling them, hey, this is your induction therapy and your transplant is the goal. No, we're trying our best to decide that patient's life journey with myeloma over the next 10, 15, and hopefully more years. So we're trying to pick and choose the regimen that is most likely going to help the patient the most today, and most likely will give a longer duration of the response. So when you say survivorship, that also very importantly brings up the point that patients are living with myeloma longer. We have to manage their health overall. So looking for any side effects from treatment, managing them very well, so the patient is able to stay on the treatment and maintain good quality of life. There are actually clinical trials looking at stopping treatment when there is a very deep prolonged response, again, going towards survivorship and giving the patients quality of life. There is looking for other cancers. In fact, I had a patient in the clinic and we were talking about just myeloma in general, and I was telling them, okay, please remember, you may not want to do a colonoscopy, but you already have one myeloma cancer diagnosis. The risk of subsequent cancers is always there in any cancer patient. So uh, that was a male person. So I said, okay, please do not miss your colonoscopy. Please do not miss your prostate screening. And whatever is age appropriate must be done. So managing everything because myeloma is not a sprint, it's a marathon. We want to make sure that we pace ourselves well. So we manage all the symptoms, all the signs. Bone health becomes much, much more important because the same bone structure is now going to carry us longer um, and many more years. And as you rightly said, planning which treatment comes first, which comes next, when does CAR-T come? It's not that everybody must get CAR-T today. That's not the answer. Um, so what to use when becomes extremely more important. Okay, thank you for that. And thank you, Dr. Alawadi, for that important reminder. All of you watching, get your regular screenings, like he said, prostate cancer, mammograms, colonoscopies, get it done. So um, thank you for that. One of the things that comes up with that uh, regular, not regular screening, but monitoring after certain therapies for future malignancies, um, there's been some discussions about post-CAR T, um, particularly with T cell malignancies and monitoring for that. Can you just give a little description of that and any concerns that you have with that or any um, encouragement you have regarding that and whether that weighs into your treatment options that you give to patients when they are asking about CAR T therapy? Absolutely. Extremely important question, Lisa. This has this really had a lot of discussion going on. It's been going on for the past few months now. Okay, so first let's let's clear out the let's let's explain the uh, landscape. The FDA reviewed CAR T cell treatment because of the fact that there were about 19 T cell malignancies noted in several thousand patients. Out of those 19 cases of T cell malignancies, there was one case of multiple myeloma to the best of my knowledge. Now, risk of subsequent cancers is something, unfortunately, every cancer patient lives with, but in myeloma, we have known about that especially from our historical knowledge of second malignancies with lenalidomide-based maintenance therapy post-transplant. So subsequent malignancies has always been a risk. There is some risk that is being talked about with CAR-T. 
But frankly speaking, the way I look at it, the risk is significantly lesser than the potential benefit. Because remember, when these CAR-T therapies, the two agents got approved in myeloma, they were approved in a situation that there was no standard therapy. And we saw somewhere about 70, 75% response rate with one of them and about 98% response rate with the other one. So in a setting where there was nothing, you can see the degree of benefit. And the risk of second malignancies is relatively small. So we must discuss this. A patient must be aware of it. But I think the benefit is way more than the risk. So we document, we discuss, we have specific documentation that we do and specific information that we share with patients. But I think still the benefit is significantly more than the risk. Great. Thank you so much for explaining that. And for any of you out there watching this, um, Dr. Alawadi is a myeloma specialist, and I highly encourage anybody who is looking at CAR-T therapy or even for a first consult for myeloma, seek out even one consult from a myeloma specialist. It is so important in trying to understand these therapies and any fears you may have regarding those therapies and the risks of that. So really appreciate that, Dr. Alawadi. Thank you. So I think it's time now for... Um, to start answering questions from patients that we receive from all of you in the audience. Please remember this is not a substitute for medical care. Always consult with your medical team. And we are going to jump right in, Dr. Alawadi. We have a lot of um, questions from patients here. And I'll just start with the first one. Um, this patient is asking, my M spike keeps rising in spite of chemo. What can I do? Uh, very important uh, question. Every patient must understand what their disease marker is. This patient is asking about the M spike, which is the monoclonal spike, uh, whether it's in the blood or in the urine. And if the M spike is continuing to increase and there is a significant increase, significant is def defined by at least 25% from the nadir or from the bottommost point with at, the, at least a um, absolute increase of 0 0.5 gram per deciliter, so half a gram per deciliter. So we want a 25% increase, but we also want at least 0.5 gram per deciliter. So if somebody had an M spike of one at their best point, then the increase to 1.5 is significant. If somebody had the M spike of 0 0.2, then it's not the 25% increase, it's the 0.5 that must happen. So they hit 0 0.7, and that's a significant increase. So that's how we think about M-spike, 25% with an absolute of at least 0.5 gram per deciliter. If that is indeed happening, this would be considered a biochemical progression. And at that point, it should be considered to switch around the treatment because we don't want the disease to grow to the point that there are actually symptoms showing up or organ damage happening we want to be able to capture the disease progression sooner and act upon it. Great, thank you. Do you have any recommendations for people who, um, as we might have some patients watching this who are light chain only, any guidelines on if those numbers are rising? That's excellent question too. So if somebody has light chains as their marker, we are looking at an increase in the involved serum-free light chain. So if somebody has kappa as their marker, the kappa is going up or if they have lambda as the marker, the lambda is going up. Typically, if both of them go up, that is not disease progression. That could be coming from kidney dysfunction. Somebody is dehydrated and they get labs checked, both cap and lambda might be elevated. Again, a 25% increase in the absolute, um, but at the same time, we are also looking at at least 10 milligram per deciliter change. So if somebody had a uh, light chain of, two milligram per deciliter. If it goes to 12, that might be a significant change. But I can say that light chains are a little bit more volatile and they do get affected by our fluid status. So if I ever notice a patient with a light chain increase, I'm more likely to repeat the test very soon, maybe even at a couple of days, one week interval, just to make sure that there is a trend rather than just a fluctuating light chain. Okay, thank you for that information. And, and I should maybe uh, very quickly add, we do not check light chains in the urine. Light chains should be checked in the blood. Urine light chains are very nonspecific and there's no need to test them. Okay, that's helpful also. So patients don't have to walk around with their big orange jugs, you know, full of fluids. So thank you. 
All right, this might be a um, complicated question to answer, um, but in general terms, for those who relapse for the first time, what are the best treatment options? I think that's a very important and, and I can imagine a scary situation. So somebody who relapses in general, not just even the first time, the factors that are taken into account for deciding what treatment they should get, there are broadly three categories of factors. Patient factors, deciding what's the age, what's the uh, other comorbidities, uh, are they a diabetic, are they heart disease, uh, kidney dysfunction, because those things go into the decision of what may or may not be given. So patient factors. Also importantly, how close are you to your treatment center? Can you come in for infusional or injection drugs time and again? Can you prefer or do you prefer oral drugs only, um, et cetera? Those things become important. Then, that, so that's patient factors. Then disease factors. How fast is the progression? Is it high-risk disease, standard-risk disease? Is it biochemical progression like the previous person asked? Or is it actually a clinical progression in which the, there's kidney dysfunction or anemia or bone disease because the choices and the urgency of treatment may change. So patient factors, disease factors, and then drug factors are the third class or third category, which is what have you had before? How long have you been on it? Are you on maintenance or not? Is your disease considered refractory to a certain agent, meaning resistant to a certain agent? Typically, if you were on a treatment and your disease is progressing, that same drug may not be used again. I mean, there are some times that we will reuse a drug, but generally not. We can use the same class, but we may not typically use the same drug. So I think the choice of treatment depends on all of those factors put in. Uh, and then we come up with one or two or three regimens and we discuss them with patients. And of course, being an academic uh, physician, I must say there is always, you must always seek out uh, good clinical trials if they're available to you. That is the way our, our field moves forward. Yes, thank you for that information. So we have another patient asking, do myeloma patients require multiple prior therapies prior to being eligible for CAR-T? And what's the rationale for not implementing CAR-T immediately, which probably has to do with FDA approval based on clinical yeah. trials at this point? Absolutely, you're absolutely right, Lisa. So any drug, let alone CAR-T, any drug can only be given in the situation that it is approved by the FDA. So basically, in accordance with that drug's FDA approval label. Currently, CAR T-cell therapy is approved in the U.S. after at least four prior lines of therapy, and the patient must have had treatment with at least one proteasome inhibitor, for which we have three drugs, bortezomib, ixazomib, and carfilzomib. They must have been treated with at least one prior immunomodulatory drug, lenalidomide, thalidomide, pomalidomide, and they must have been previously treated by at least one monoclonal antibody, dartumumab or isotuximab. Once the patient has had all these criteria met, they become a candidate for CAR T-cell therapy. Frankly, we cannot just use a drug anywhere because we cannot use a drug where it has not shown to be of benefit, and importantly, it has not shown to be of any uh, risk. So CAR T-cell therapy in the first-line setting has been, is being studied in clinical trials, but is not FDA approved. Currently approved only after four prior lines, but the FDA is reviewing data for both the CAR Ts to see if they may be um, uh, available sooner. As of right now, that approval is still pending. Okay, thank you. We're hopeful that that will happen soon. <laughs> yeah. So interesting question from a patient, does CAR T therapy actually change one's DNA? No, the CAR-T therapy does not change one's DNA. What happens is there are T cells taken out of a patient. The DNA of those T cells is modified. And then those T cells are given back to the patient. Those T cells do not go and integrate into your other healthy body cells or your stem cells, et cetera. Those T cells, it's almost like giving a, a boost of immunity, which is targeted against your myeloma. So those T cells go in and they kill those myeloma cells. Now we hope that those T cells perpetuate and teach or uh, create some memory T 
T cells, and that immunity lasts a little bit longer. But all of that genetic modification stays within the T cells. It does not integrate anywhere else. Now, I know there was a previous question about T cell lymphomas. That is related to this question in a way because the risk that is theoretical is that that genetic modification in the T cells might make those T cells replicate uncontrollably, leading to a T cell cancer or T cell lymphoma. But I'm saying that this is theoretical because while it is possible, it ext happens extremely rarely. And even in the cases where the, uh, uh, the cancer happened, it has been seen that the cancer may not come from that portion of the DNA that was, uh, that's where the modification was done. So low risk. So what would be the next steps, Dr. Alawadi, for a patient who's had CAR-T and reaches a relapsed state or is relapsed? Yep. Uh, this is something, uh, unfortunately, is the truth of the matter in myeloma at least, that we, are, we don't see cures. Um, we have had some long remissions. I have, for example, patients who are now reaching three, three and a half years on, of remission on uh, CAR-T treatment who received it on clinical trials even before they got FDA approved. But um, unfortunately, the disease does come back. So what happens is uh, we are seeing data that the novel, other novel immunotherapies like bispecific antibodies, even the ones who go after the same target as CAR-T, BCMA targeting bispecifics, they do have some response rates, good response rates in post-CAR T setting. So the bispecific antibodies by themselves may give a 60 to 65% response, but in the post-CAR T setting, that response might go down to 40, 45%. So less responses, but still possible. There are also bispecific antibody that is one available, uh, which is not against BCMA, it is against GPRC5D. That's a, a bispecific called talkitumab. So a novel target. Uh, there is, there are of course a lot of clinical trials. Uh, there are some clinical trials that are even looking at CAR T, post CAR T, so a different kind of a CAR T. Those clinical trials are going out. So what I would suggest is that if your disease progresses after CAR T cell treatment, you should very strongly consider getting to a, uh, a specialist myeloma center and get an opinion, like you mentioned, Lisa. That is so important because the choice of treatment is extremely important at that time. And we are trying our best to sequence all the options we have. In a way, actually, one of my patients mentioned um, one of these days, hey, does that mean that I'm basically buying time till something new and exciting comes along? And I said, in a way, that is true, that we are trying to stretch all our treatments and get to the point that something new and promising, just like CAR-T comes. And hopefully we get longer benefits again. Thank you for that. So when you say there's a possibility of CAR-T and then a post-CAR-T, maybe a second CAR-T, would that be a different target then? So there could be a different target. I have, uh, in fact, I saw a patient who had received one CAR-T in a clinical trial, and then they were subsequently able to receive a CAR-T as standard of care, which had been FDA approved. So they used different CAR-Ts, but one was in clinical trial and one was a standard of care. Oh, great. Okay. Again, important to see a myeloma specialist to tease out all this information. Thank you. All right. This patient is asking, I'm 81 and living with comorbidities. The myeloma was diagnosed after bone marrow test. How is treatment fitness determined? And also a question about that is if you're given an ECOG status of something, you don't like it. Can that be improved after you've had treatment? Maybe Absolutely. be eligible for a trial or something. Correct, correct. That is so important. When when uh, when this patient mentions that they are 81 year old and they're living with comorbidities, I think so. When I'm talking to a patient who's new uh, to me, it's very important for me to try to tease out what was their performance status or their fitness status prior to myeloma, because my goal is to try to get them as close to that as possible. Now, if this patient is saying that they were already quite frail before the diagnosis of myeloma and myeloma has added to the frailty, then it becomes a little tricky because we're starting in a difficult spot. We do determine fitness by asking questions, simple questions like, what can a patient do at baseline? Can they do grocery store or grocery shopping by themselves? Can they walk around the block? Do they get short of breath, um, et cetera? 
Um, and frankly, there are 81 year olds who are playing golf every day and are fitter than me. So I'm just saying that age by itself is not the criteria. And Lisa, like you rightly mentioned, if there are uh, fitness issues coming from the disease itself, then that's the time that we actually have to work with uh, sim uh, work with the treatment, get the treatment started, and then assess the fitness a couple of months later, a couple of cycles later, because the treatment may have worked and may have improved the uh, fitness quite a bit. Great. Thank you for that. So this person is asking, their husband is starting maintenance therapy, so I'm assuming they just finished induction therapy. Having leg pains, mostly at night, could this be a form of peripheral neuropathy or is maybe from bisphosphonates or from any of the medications that maybe were used during induction? So, uh, excellent question. So uh, this is almost going back to that survivorship question that we discussed earlier, that it's so important to manage the side effects and maintain quality of life. So uh, a lot of patients with myeloma will say that I have cramping or symptoms or, or some pins and needles at night more so. Well, part of it is because body's at rest, relaxed, um, things, symptoms become more focused. Um, yes, it could be peripheral neuropathy, but at the same time, certain drugs called muscle cramping or what's called myalgias, sometimes maintenance therapies can cause that. It's important for somebody to be able to determine, is it coming from muscles or nerves? Is it coming because some electrolytes are abnormal? Like one of the common things is low magnesium or low potassium can cause neuropathy, for example, or cramping. I've had patients who will get some over-the-counter lotions or um, some foams, et cetera, which are infused with some electrolytes and say that they feel some benefit. So topical things are good. So I think it's important to figure out, is it muscle or nerve? And is it coming from drug or disease? And that's where your physician can help tease it out. Okay, thank you. So we have a patient who is talking about her genetic um, abnormalities, but has been through both auto and allo stem cell transplant in the last two years and has relapsed and is asking, can CAR T cell therapy help me? And would she even be eligible for CAR T therapy given the allo transplant? That's an important question. Um, so, so first of all, sorry to hear that that your disease is behaving that aggressively that you've had both the transplants in the past two years and still having issues. So yes, CAR-T can still be used after an allo transplant. There are some criteria. You should not be on any graft-versus-host suppressive medications, and you should not have any active graft-versus-host disease going on. So depending on those, yes, patients can get CAR-T post allo. In fact, I've had a couple of patients who've had CAR-T after allo transplant. Great, thank you. I'm sure that'll give this patient some hope. Um, are there any studies showing that treatment can be tapered to bi daily once 90% reduction in myeloma has occurred with various therapies? So in general, um, you may know what, this, what medication this patient's talking about, but is that possible to do that, to taper therapy? So... Absolutely. First of all, in myeloma care, uh, Lisa, you had mentioned initially that as somebody went to maintenance, they may have had induction. So there are these terms used for categories of treatment, induction, consolidation, maintenance. But if the disease gets controlled adequately at a certain time point, the treatment can be modified to a maintenance. I, it depends on the regimen. Uh, some regimens, for example, we are able to get rid of the steroids after a certain time. And then in certain regimens, the drugs can be reduced in dose or frequency, etc. All of the drugs we use have maintenance regimens and maintenance uh, doses. Uh, but I should put a word of caution there. I see very frequently that the moment the labs improved, this quote-unquote maintenance is brought in. That's not the right way to do things. The right way is to go back to the clinical trial based on which this regimen was started. And according to that clinical trial, after however many cycles of treatment, the maintenance was supposed to happen, it should happen. So if I'll, I'll very quickly say, if somebody stays, starts on a regimen and within four months, their M spike comes down and now it has plateaued because our drugs are so good that they work that fast. And somebody says, okay, Four months of that is enough. Let's save it for the future. Let's go to maintenance. I would say absolutely not. 
In fact, there is data suggested from a couple of regimens that if significant modifications were made prior to one year of the regimen, then the outcomes were inferior. And I'm not going in specific regimens and I'm not saying that that is applicable to everything. But what I'm saying is, yes, maintenance and tapering is possible. In fact, there are clinical trials looking at even stopping medication, but when and how that change is to be made is very, very important, it's critical. If your physician is not comfortable about that time point, reach out to a myeloma specialist. They should be able to guide when and how to reduce or taper or put on maintenance. Thank you. And that's very important what you said about induction therapy. Go back to the clinical trial and look and see what the the clinical trial said as far as how long that treatment should last, because it is exciting as a patient when you start seeing those numbers dropping exponentially, they're just plummeting and you want to go off, but you don't feel great. It's, it's hard to stay on a therapy for six to 12 months that you don't really enjoy and nobody really does. So that's important. Mm -hmm. And then maybe talk about maintenance therapy later. It would be nice to have limited duration maintenance sometime in the future for induction therapy, stick with what the clinical trial says. So Okay, this patient is asking another really important question. I have myeloma, and now my daughter does as well. She's 37. Is multiple myeloma hereditary? And I'm sorry to hear about the situation, and I'm so sorry that your uh, daughter, who's 37, got diagnosed. Um, There is a small, very small number of very young patients, and I'm using this term very young, which is just a generic thing that I've said, because myeloma, median age of diagnosis is 68. Uh, But at the same time, yesterday, I saw a patient who was diagnosed at 33, and they're 40 Mm -hmm. now, and they've already gone through every single thing that they can think of, Um, and we were talking about clinical trials. So so typically, myeloma is not hereditary. It is not something that is passed along through the generations. But what I would say is that there is, if this sort of a situation is happening, that uh, you have myeloma, and now your daughter has it at a young age it is important for you to consider getting a genetic uh, counseling, uh, so a genetic consult for them to be able to look deeper into it. There is not a very standard specific test. So for me to say, hey, you go and get this genetic test done and that'll find out this mutation or whatever. But it's important to get go through some genetic counseling for them to be able to look a little bit deeper, some next generation sequencing, uh, what is called germline testing or somatic testing. They should be able to compare both the parent and the daughter's um, disease, as well as uh, what's called germline, which is their native DNA, which they were born with, to see if there is anything that jumps out of them. But that would be important to go through at a uh, larger cancer center, or if that service is available through your local physician also, that would be great. Great. Thank you. Well, I think that's it for our questions. That's all that we have time for. But Dr. Alawadi, thank you so much for once again being part of our Patient Empowerment Network Start Here program, because it really is these kind of conversations that help patients, me included, feel more empowered to take questions back to our providers and our healthcare team. So thank you so much for joining us. And thank you out there to everybody who's watching this program. We appreciate you and we, we appreciate your time and expertise. Thanks a lot. Look forward to next times. Thank you. I'm Lisa Hatfield. Thank you for joining this Patient Empowerment Network program, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you. 